Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Corinne Cash. I'm a senior program staff at the Cody International Institute and an assistant professor in the Bachelor of Art and Science in Climate and Environment program here at St. Bex University. I will be your MC today for supporting resident action to protect homes from flooding in Northern Nova Scotia. Before we begin, we begin the webinar. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kevin Wamsley, President of Sanovax University, to provide a land acknowledgement. Thank you very much, Corinne. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the town of Antigonish, the municipality of Antigonish, and St. Francis Xavier University are located in Mi'kmaq, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I would like to express my gratitude to the Buttonkeck First Nation for being an important partner in our environmental sustainability. Thank you, President Walmsley. I will now provide an overview of the format of the webinar in our agenda today. Uh, today, we are going to be uh, together for 60 minutes or 90 minutes in total, 60 minutes of presentation and uh, 30 minutes of moderated question and answer. Uh, attendees will be able to view all panelists presenters, but will have video or audio enabled during the course of the webinar. Use the instant chat function to post questions to presenters. Two questions will be chosen by the MC to be answered by presenters after each section. Please keep your questions short and to the point. Use instant chat to pose more general questions for the final minutes of the webinar. Code of conduct. Please be courteous to all presenters, as I know you will, and attendees taking part in the webinar. What attendees will receive after the webinar? The following will be emailed to all of you after this webinar. You will receive the Home Flood Protection Outreach Toolkit, the presentation slides from today, a link to the presentation recording, and the, an exit survey. So the agenda today, uh, we are going to have some introductory remarks before uh, an overview of impacts of flooding in Canada with a particular focus on the Atlantic provinces. The third uh, item on the agenda is using a community-based approach to support resident action to protect flood homes from flooding. And then we will move into key home flood protection resources developed to support resident action. And then we will conclude with next steps and a discussion. To open the introductory remarks, I would like to introduce Lori Boucher, the mayor of the town of Antigonish. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kat, and thank you to everyone out there who's taken time to join us this morning. This is an important partnership for the town of Antigonish, and we're so excited to collaborate with St. Avax, the municipality of the county of Antigonish, and Puktukek's First Nation. This partnership demonstrates how, how interwoven our communities are and how we make up the greater community of Antigonish. It is no secret that the town of Antigonish, Antigonish has experienced flooding in the past. And now with the changing weather patterns and, and experience, we are experiencing more frequent and less predictable flooding. Uh, it is eight, about 18 months ago that our council undertook the, the task of creating a new municipal planning strategy and, and land use bylaw. One of the main pillars that I'm very proud of is, is the environmental and sustainability pillars. When this document was first presented to our council, we were presented with three options. One, do we use a plan with the current condition, conditions? Or do we adopt, adopt a plan taking consideration of the effects of climate change with the project, projected conditions of 20 years out? Or do we adopt a plan taking consideration the effects of climate change with projection of the conditions 50 years out? I'm very pleased to say that our council took the bold step of using the 50 year flood mapping model uh, when we're, and when we're making future land use decisions. 
because the town of Van de is landlocked, uh, this made it very challenging for our council and our planning committee and for our planning department to come up with new ideas how to uh, develop and use the land in, in, within our town boundaries. Um, this decision of using the 50 years into the future uh, map, flood mapping along with this partnership that, that we, are, we, are, we are here today uh, with a mandate to create awareness of the effects of climate change and provide opportunities to educate our residents uh, as well as provide practical solutions to mitigate the effects of climate change. This all demonstrates our council's commitment to the, our greater community and to the future. Our community members also play an integral role in pushing our council to look beyond our four-year uh, four year terms and look what is Anakinish going to face in the future? What are our children and our grandchildren going to face? Uh, and I, I can't say, I can't, without uh, talking about this, it's hard not to mention the influence of St. Abex and St. And St. Martha's Hospital, as well as our community groups. Uh, Anakinish is very lucky to have some very active citizens um, Anakinish Community Energy, Responsible Energy Anakinish, and Sustainable Anakinish, who are constantly reminding us of our responsibility to the next generation. I hope you all get some practical information from today's session to help you and your family and your friends and neighbors to protect your home from future floods. On behalf of Council, myself, uh, Thank you to Dr. Feldmaid for sharing your expertise. I had the pleasure of, of listening to you when you were in town, uh, Dr. Uh, Feldmaid, and, and it's, you're very, very informative, and I, I believe that everybody listening today is going to take some very practical information uh, uh, away with them for today. And thank you to you too, Dr. Walmsley, Kevin Walmsley, for uh, taking the lead on this project. Uh, the town uh, really appreciates your efforts and uh, we're happy to be part of this, this project. And of course, to all of you who decided to join us today to take that next step and, and who want to make sure that your home is protected from uh, future uh, weather conditions in the future. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you, Mayor Boucher. I would now like to invite Owen McCarran, the warden of the municipality of the County of Antigonish to speak. Thank you, Dr. Cash, and good morning and welcome from the municipality of the County of Antigonish. I'm Warden Owen McCarran, and we're excited to be with our partners, St. of X University, Quackenkeck First Nation, and the town of Antigonish as we continue to build and strengthen our communities together while jointly addressing and adapting to climate change. As we work through this global pandemic, now more than ever, working collaboratively is of, vital, is of vital importance. Looking at ways to mitigate the effects of climate change at the local level is critical to our success. Land use planning plays a huge role in this. At this time of year when flooding potential is so real, a workshop like this is both timely and important. This workshop will help inform and equip residents with the necessary tools to help safeguard their homes and our properties. This workshop is the first collective action of a regional team in developing strategies to combat climate change here locally. I'd like to thank Dr. Feltmaid and his team from the INTAC Center for coming to our community and sharing their expertise. As we know, our community has a great respect and close relationship with our land through farming, fishing, and forestry, and just a pure love of nature. What we learn here today will help our collective community build climate resilience, and this starts by protecting our homes. So on behalf of our council and staff at the County of Anikinish, I'd like to welcome all the participants and look forward to sharing lots of thoughts and ideas as the workshop unfolds. Thanks again, folks, and have a good day. Thank you, Warden McCarran. I would now like to welcome uh, Kevin Walmsley back to provide his introductory remarks. Uh, Dr. Walmsley, I think that you need to unmute. Good idea. There we go. Thank you very much for unmuting me. 
it's a real thrill for me to be here today. Um, we got started in the fall when Dr. Cash organized Environment Week at Santa Fe University and uh, brought in special guest uh, Blair Feltmake um, to kick off the week and to spend time with us. Uh, and then he brought his team together um, to introduce this proposal for us. And uh, we were fortunate, to, uh, I'm very happy to uh, form a partnership uh, with the, uh, the town of Antigonish, the municipality, the county of Antigonish, and with Buttonkeck First Nation, uh, a partnership which will be dealing with environmental sustainability in our region. And I'm very pleased uh, to see so many people from around the, uh, the region uh, in our territory um, involved in this project, the first of many, I hope, in the future. I'm very excited about uh, this morning's webinar, some very practical advice for homeowners, and really it's about making a difference in our region, and, and I'm very excited about the prospect. So welcome to everyone. It's going to be a great day. Thank you. And now... If I could just review uh, the purpose of the webinar, um, what we're going to be looking at today is a community-based approach to support uh, resident action to protect their homes for flooding, from flooding. And that's something that's important to us all. We want to educate everyone about uh, the common flood risks at home and, uh, and to introduce some simple and cost-effective opportunities to reduce those risks. And that's what Blair and his team are prepared to do this morning. So we'll be looking to educate everyone um, and to provide a community-based outreach toolkit that can be customized for us to support local action uh, with respect to flooding. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, from the INTAC Center on Climate Adaptation, Dr. Blair Feltmate. Welcome, Blair. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, and certainly um, I appreciate well being here this morning with our uh, uh, colleagues, previous speakers to address such an important uh, topic as that which is uh, profiled on the top of this slide. Uh, over the course of the next uh, maybe eight or 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna present an overview of the impacts of uh, flooding in Canada. And, um, and I'm gonna focus on three take home points before turning the material over to, to my colleagues. First, I wanna make the point that climate change is irreversible. Climate change is here to stay, uh, period. And we're not going backwards on climate change. And this is not my uh, cavalier opinion. This has been well established by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and more recently in Canada's Changing Climate Report 2019. Uh, so we should be doing everything we can as a country and globally to, to lower greenhouse gas emissions, but we need to recognize that uh, um, uh, going forward, climate change is going to affect uh, a greater uh, degree of extreme weather events and particularly in the world of flooding. Um, the, so uh, given that climate change is irreversible and flood risk will become more problematic going forward, that all sounds kind of depressing, but there is some good news. And what I'm going to end with is the point that Canada has not been sitting on its hands relative to uh, preparing for climate change and flood risk. We've developed some very good practical cost-effective guidelines and standards to mitigate flood risk, and I'll, I'll end with focusing on a few of those points. So, uh, why is home flooding on the rise? Uh, number one, and as I alluded to, precipitation or rainfall levels are increasing in uh, many areas of Canada. This is particularly problematic in uh, uh, central to eastern Canada. The intensity, the duration, and the frequency of rainfall events is, is, is on the rise, which course contributes to flooding and uh, very often people have the perception that to be at risk of flooding you have to be in close proximity to to water or flowing water systems um, and that that's true that that certainly can be problematic uh, for flood risk if you're close to flowing water or your house is on the edge of a, a river for example however what's also being experienced is we're realizing more and more microburst storms these are storms whereby effectively a water bomb, a very large volume of water can come down over a very short period of time and affect flooding for homes located pretty much anywhere, perhaps short of, you know, if you live on a mountaintop. So people need to proceed with the assumption that if you own a home somewhere where it rains, you're at risk of flooding. There may be areas where you're at more risk, but you're certainly at risk of flooding. And we're now realizing home flood risk for uh, 
for people that, uh, for their homes that would otherwise never show up on any flood risk maps, um, flood risk maps. So precipitation is on the rise and that's affecting um, uh, flood risk. Number two, as a general trend for Canada, we've seen a loss of uh, natural infrastructure, that which was previously here before we started to build or engage development. We've lost on average across the country, particularly through the southern regions of the provinces, about 60 to 80 percent of the natural infrastructure that was originally here, the forests, the fields, the wetlands. When the natural infrastructure is in place and the big storms hit, it gives water a place to go or to store and then slowly discharge downstream or into the groundwater system. But when we pave over the landscape or uh, have in many cases uh, various forms of large-scale agricultural development, Whoa. when these big storms hit, uh, the water does not stay on the landscape very long. It tends to run off very quickly, which um, also contributes to flood risk. The third point on the screen is also we have aging municipal infrastructure that when it breaks down, that contributes to flooding. And we have uh, aging uh, uh, infrastructure at the level of the individual house. So it's a combination of these uh, uh, four factors that affect uh, uh, an increase in flood risk for the country. And just to illustrate what this looks like more specifically, if you have the next slide, please. Um, what you're looking at on this chart is uh, money paid out through uh, property and casualty insurance claims for catastrophic loss events, catastrophic loss insurable events. And in insurance terms, a catastrophic event is any event like a flood, a fire, a hailstorm, windstorm, if it triggers more than $25 million in insurable claims, it's, called, it's classified as a catastrophic insurable event. And the Insurance Bureau of Canada, along with a group called CAT-IQ, they add these numbers up on an annual basis and they plot them out as, uh, as you see on this figure. And so what you're looking at on the x-axis is in the lower left-hand corner, we're starting in 1983 and to the right we go across to 2019. And on the y-axis is the money paid out in billions of dollars for catastrophic loss insurable events. And what's notable here, and by the way, all of this paints the picture of why do we want to put measures in place to mitigate home flood risk. So that's where we're heading, uh, just to restate that point. But what you see here is from 1983 up to uh, about 2008, that the insurance industry could count on paying out between about 250 and four to 450 million dollars per year in catastrophic loss claims. Uh, there was the odd spike here and there, such as 1998, when a lot of money was paid out due to the uh, eastern ice storm. But on average, the industry could count on paying out between about 250 to 450 million dollars per year. But things started to change on or about 2009 onward to 2019 whereby for 10 out of the last 11 years, the catastrophic loss insurable claims have gone over a billion dollars per year, every year for uh, 10 out of the last 11 years. And, and by the way, all the data that you're looking at here, you might think, well, it's just, is that just because we're insuring more houses or the cost of housing has gone up, for example, and that's what's uh, causing this increase in costs. Um, all the data that you're seeing on the screen has been corrected for inflation to 2019 dollars, and it's corrected for wealth accumulation. In other words, if you were insuring twice as many homes today as you did 10 years ago, you would expect the, the, the insurance claims to be twice as high. So all of that, those factors have been factored out of this data. It's been normalized for those effects. So horizontally here, you're seeing a comparison of apples to apples over time. And now from 2009 onward, the factor that is explaining most of the upward bend in this curve is uh, too much water in the wrong place. It explains about 55, 60% of the, the, the problem you see on the screen. And, uh, and, and then even more specifically, it's water landing in basements. It's, it's basement flood risk. So the, um, and it's to the point that from an insurance perspective, the uh, insurance premiums have risen uh, 20 to 25% over uh, uh, the last five years. 60% of that increase is due to flooding basements. The uh, insurance coverage that keep people can receive for their homes for basement flooding uh, is increasingly so being lowered or a cap limit put in place in the order of uh, maybe 10 to $20,000 maximum coverage for homes that are at higher risk. 
with the average cost of basement flooding in Canada being on the order of about $43,000, uh, that is particularly problematic for people that either have a, a fairly low cap on their insurable coverage, or in some cases now, and this is a growing trend across the country and certainly problematic in, in Eastern Canada, people are increasingly, increasingly so finding that they can get no insurance coverage for their homes relative to basement flood risk. Uh, they can still get theft and fire, but in some cases it's just the premium the insurers would have to charge to mitigate the flood risk would be, would be off the charts. Nobody uh, could afford it. So the, um, and by the way, if we take this data that is focusing on Canada and break it down into that which has been realized in, for example, in Nova Scotia, uh, factors that are contributing to some of these bars towards the right-hand side of the page include, uh, in 2003, uh, Hurricane Juan cost Nova Scotia about $225 million in insurable losses. In 2010, there was a, a flood risk in Nova Scotia that cost on the order of $25 million. In 2016, Hurricane Matthew cost uh, Nova Scotia a loss of $100 million in or realization of $100 million in insurable claims. And then pretty much everybody would remember Hurricane Dorian last year, which also affected about $100 million in insurable claims. So these are all water-related events. Um, so there's no question that the, the, the challenge of extreme weather risk and flooding is on the, on the rise uh, across Canada, and we need to do something about it. If we go to the next slide, uh, you can see that uh, this is really just to illustrate that I'm not making all this stuff up. These are uh, headlines from the, the newspapers throughout the Maritimes where uh, flooding has been uh, recorded and recorded increasingly so as being problematic. As I mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, going forward, flood risk in Canada, for sure, guaranteed, is going to become more problematic and central to Eastern uh, Canada. So we have to prepare for uh, that risk so that we avoid the headlines such as you see presented on the, uh, the slide. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Now, everything I've said is, is quite depressing and it, it's, you know, it's not a good place to start first thing in the morning. However, there is some good news, and that is that, as I mentioned early on, Canada has not been sitting on its hands relative to identifying practical and cost-effective means to mitigate uh, flood risk. And I'll, I'm just going to very quickly describe some of the direction that has been outlined in this regard, and then we're going to follow with the upper left-hand corner. That's why the dotted line is around the report. Uh, we're going to zero in on uh, flood risk mitigation for the home. But just to illustrate, in the upper left-hand corner, through work led by the National Research Council, Standards Council of Canada, Canadian Standards Association, uh, very much the Intac Center right in the, in the middle of this stuff. Um, uh, we've developed very good practical guidance on how to mitigate flood risk, in this case on the upper left hand corner at the level of the individual home. And that's what we're gonna focus on for the subsequent, subsequent part of the discussion. But the other reports you see also address flood risk at various levels, and by the way, Every report that's on the screen involved bringing together about 45 to 65 people from across the country, builders, developers, insurers, conservation authorities, climate scientists. So you pretty much name it, uh, municipal engineers, planners, uh, pretty much anybody who had expertise that needed to come to the table to identify how do we mitigate flood risk practically as per the various subject matters identified, they were there. In the top uh, row in the center, we have good guidance in Canada on, on how to mitigate flood risk for new residential community design. How do we build new residential communities in Canada with fundamental features and characteristics in place that make it such that when the big storms hit, the community doesn't flood out? And by the way, that report starts with don't build on a floodplain. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, we have a um, uh, report that focuses on flood risk mitigation for existing communities. And uh, I can tell you for sure that when Hurricane Dorian hit, I got a lot of calls and a lot of interviews about the material that's presented in this report as to what we can do to mitigate flood risk at the existing community level using berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, bioswales, putting structures and features in place that make it such that when the big storms hit, we don't get flooded out and or we're not running out all the, the last minute putting hundreds of thousands of sandbags in place. Uh, sandbags should be the point of last report, resort, 
not the point of first resort. Then in the lower left-hand corner, we have very good guidance on flood risk mitigation for commercial real estate, uh, office towers and condominium towers. What can we do to make it such when the big storms hit, the basements of these facilities don't flood out? In the bottom row middle, in all of these features and developments, we are increasingly so realizing that uh, uh, natural infrastructure, retaining and or restoring natural infrastructure, very much factors into uh, mitigating flood risk. And that's what uh, that report focuses on is uh, what is the nature of that return. And in the lower right hand corner, just before I finish up, the everything we've I've mentioned so far focuses on dollars being paid out to address flood risk. But we also have done some, I think, fairly good work to identify the mental health or the psychosocial impacts associated with, uh, uh, particularly in this case, residential basement flooding. Uh, for many years after people realize a flooded basement, the stress level they feel every time there's a major precipitation event is very, very high. So the psychosocial or mental health impacts of flooding should not be uh, discounted. So having said that, um, uh, I'll stop there because we're gonna turn it to my colleagues to zero in on uh, flood protection at the level of the individual house. And I think Corinne, we might be stopping here for a question or two, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, that's correct. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question comes from Kate Potter and she asked, what is the link for these resources? In terms of any of the reports that you see on the screen uh, here, and, and by the way, this is not to meant to be a commercial for the Intact Center, but nonetheless, that's where the link is. If you go to the Intact, if you just type Intact Center on Climate Adaptation, you will see that icon come up along the top of the screen that says reports, and all of these reports are there. Uh, you can just click on them and download them. And by the way, every report is also designed with an executive summary that can be read in two to three minutes that really gets to the point and the key findings of the report. So they're all on our website for uh, Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. Great, I just see that Daniel has provided a link to the resources. So all, uh, all attendees can access it that way. Uh, Chris Chopik uh, has asked, what is being done to engage the real estate industry on this file? What is the current status of open disclosure of site level flood risk in Canada? Uh, well, so two parts to that question. The first part is we're now working, and, and by the way, we, uh, we're working in Ontario, but we, can do, we'll, we will be doing this uh, across all provinces. At the moment, we're working with the Ontario Real Estate Association to provide a five-part uh, educational seminar to real estate agents that focuses on climate change, extreme weather risk, and home flood protection. So that um, it's a five part course, 15 minutes per segment that real estate agents can take online, complete at their own discretion in terms of timing. But it would put the real estate agents in a very good position to understand home flood risk, the factors around the outside of the property or in the basement of itself that could affect a particular property that a, a client is buying from uh, what, what, what should they have their antenna up on in terms of identifying anything that might affect a basement flood risk. And then hopefully in so doing, before the deal closes, if you're buying a home, the agent can say, we need this and this corrected before this deal closes, or we're compensated this so much on purchasing the house that we as a new purchaser uh, can remedy that problem that it would affect basement flooding. So we're educating the real estate agents across the country on mass, and there's about 80,000 in Ontario alone. I, just, I don't know the numbers for the Maritimes, but uh, so that they can give this guidance to homeowners. In terms of disclosure, uh, forced disclosure on homes that are at flood risk, it's voluntary at the moment, both with most uh, uh, real estate transactions. People are asked, uh, have you ever experienced flooding in your basement? And it's a checkbox, yes or no. And quite honestly, I believe many people don't, uh, they're not overly generous in admitting to the fact that the home they're trying to sell has experienced basement flooding. So the, uh, but what anybody purchasing a home should do is at least talk to local residents, uh, conservation authorities or the equivalent thereof to see what has been the history of flooding in this community. And indeed, is there anything we know from local residents uh, pertaining to uh, a, a, a history of flooding in this particular neighborhood or even at the level of the individual house? So the guidance is coming, but it's not fully in place yet. Right. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and pose one more question from Alex Organ. Do you know if any research of the preventative measures have been cross-referenced with wildfire protection? Many areas overlap with risks for both. Um, we're pursuing, through something called Fire Smart Canada right now, uh, uh, measures that can be put in place at the level of the uh, community for communities that are in forested regions and then homes or businesses within those communities. We're looking at the deployment of something called Fire Smart Canada, which are measures that can be implemented at the community level or the home level to lower the probability that that house will uh, experience fire in the event of fires coming through a region, such as you saw with Port Macca back in 2016. Um, when we're rebuilding homes in areas that have experienced flooding and or fire, or there's been significant damage, we are now simultaneously trying to put features in place that would mitigate fire risk and flood risk at the same time. Because when you're building new, it's quite frankly, it's not that expensive, virtually nothing, to put the right measures in place to mitigate both types of, of risk. So the directions are underway to pursue those uh, uh, two factors almost literally as we speak. Great, thank you, Dr. Feltmate. Uh, I see that there's a couple of more questions, but we're gonna move on and uh, we can address them after the presentation. Uh, so at this moment, I would like to introduce Cheryl Evans, Director of Home Flood Protection at the Intact Center. Go ahead, Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I just wanted to sort of provide an overview of what my role is at the center. My role is to help raise awareness about flood risks at the home, but then support action at the resident level to, um, to make those changes happen. So as Blair has told me many times that the goal of our center is to make on the ground change happen. If we just publish more reports that don't result in any on the ground action, essentially uh, we have failed. So it's my goal um, to work very, very collaboratively with residents, with insurance companies, with realtors, um, with uh, lots of lawyers, trust me, um, home inspectors, and uh, um, certainly municipal engineers are a critical uh, team member um, to to understand and, and um, realize that we all have a role to play. We're in this together and that we have a lot of knowledge that we can share with one another um, to help move things forward in a positive manner. Please uh, forward the slide. So this, this slide here is a quick summary of what, we, what we've determined after three years of on the ground research um, in several provinces after doing lot level assessments at over 500 homes. Um, this is the skinny. This is what we found is a challenge at homes and where there needs to be focused attention uh, to raise awareness and drive action. Something that makes our research different is we weren't just looking at the physical features at the home that present a risk at the lot level, we also wanted to find out what types of maintenance activities people were doing at the homes because we couldn't actually find any record of that anywhere when we were doing our research, uh, our lit review. So we, we asked residents um, as we went through their, their assessments with them, we asked them to explain not only, uh, not only to show us the physical features of the homes, um, but also to explain what type of maintenance they were already doing to take care of their homes. And in conversation with the residents, um, we had a collaborative problem solving conversation. And these are the top results that really bubbled up to the top as that were key risks and key actions that could be taken to reduce risk. So I'll just go through them quickly. And I'm guessing that if you think about your own home, your own neighborhood, a lot of these things will uh, ring true. So the top flood risks that were, were recorded by our assessors, our trained assessors outside the home, were that downspout discharge uh, pipes, only uh, they discharge less than two meters from the foundation. So 78%, so almost all of the downspouts are depositing too close to the foundation. 
uh, grading has been changed and subsided over time. So you're having water directing water um, rain coming uh, or water melting and the water is directed toward the foundation increasing the risk of flooding. So that's 69% which is very significant. And people who have sump, sump pump discharge pipes, 68% of those are discharging too close to the home which increases the risk that the water will be coming back into the sump pit and the sump pump will cycle and is at higher risk of burning out. So these are very significant um, risks. And you have to remember that people that participated in our assessment were sort of some of the community leaders, residents who are really interested. So these are some of the people that were really on top of their game. Um, so for the general public, we have to assume that the stats would be um, less uh, impressive than this. The top flood risks recorded inside the home included that folks who had sump pumps had no backup power for them at a rate of 84%. So if they had uh, some kind of power loss during a storm, what they were expecting to, to be able to continue to help them to pump water out of their basement um, would fail. Uh, I've, a resounding 71% of folks had furniture and, and electronics at risk of water damage, um, and 65% had valuables at risk of water damage. I remember speaking to many of my assessors at our, uh, our weekly check-ins, and they would say they couldn't even do a full assessment because there was so much stuff all over the floor, uh, particularly in basements. This is very common. Um, and the other thing is about a third of people um, have put that stuff that they store in their basements uh, or on the main, their main floor uh, where their floor drain is, they have stuff that's covering their floor drain. So it's a box of Legos, it's um, any tires, it's anything. Um, so that if there is a storm uh, or a, a flood, that water cannot enter the basement or cannot enter the drain, so it increases the damages. Now the last piece is about um, maintenance. So this is where we ask people what they were doing. So you have to realize the the essential inside and outside were visually reported by the assessors. These are self-reported. So people tend to be a little bit generous, let's say, about the maintenance they've already done. Um, so we can assume that some of these numbers might actually be a little bit higher. But what stood out was that people who had backwater valves, at least half of them had never once maintain them. Many of them had never been informed that, that, that maintenance was necessary and they were quite concerned to learn that, there, that it was necessary. Um, of the folks that actually had a backup battery uh, for their sump pump, a rarefied group, about half of those people had never once tested the battery to see if it would be working. And uh, for the people who had sump pumps, only um, a full 40% of people have never once tested their sump pumps. So we learned that people have these things in their houses and for the most part, they're just assuming that they're there and they're going to take care of them. But frankly, they have no idea if they will. Please advance the slide. So those, that was a quick summary of the top risk that we found and the goal, like I said, of our work is to support resident action to, uh, to make changes, to protect themselves. So what we did is we worked directly in communities and with local experts. So we worked in Burlington, Toronto, Clarington, uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, like I said, we trained um, assessors. Our, our assessors were from an environmental consulting group called AET Group. Um, we also worked with local insurance companies, local realtors, local community groups to uh, share out the information to make sure that it um, that it was it was accessed by as many people as possible. Uh, and we completed 510 assessments there. That's where we collected our key data. Um, we also did one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, a total of 5,500 door-to-door conversations. Um, <clears throat> we did targeted neighborhood campaigns by our trained assessors in Ontario and Saskatchewan. Um, why we chose them was because they were trusted by residents to, um, to give non-biased opinions. Um, 
We also did an interesting project with Red Cross. We trained volunteers to deliver um, problem solving at the door conversations with residents in neighborhoods who had previously experienced flooding because we really want to raise awareness and support their action to reduce risk. So we worked in Squamish, BC, Rocky View County, where we continue to do work uh, with AET and in Windsor, Ontario. We also had these one-on-one -on -one conversations at 10 community events and engaged about 33,000 residents in conversation. And we developed uh, in, in conversation and consultation with local communities, we listened to them to say, okay, we've got these base resources. What are the other resources that you need? What formats do you have them in? So we developed free self-help print and online resources for them. Um, and also for renters. And as we worked with community members, we noted that we also needed um, some information for rural folks, not just urban folks. And that we also needed some targeted information for people who didn't have basements, but were still at risk of flooding in their homes. Advance the slide, please. So the, the other piece of the work is not just looking at the fact, the physical factors, that um, that put a home at risk. We also wanted to look at the motivational, the psychological factors and understand from a lit review nationally, what are the pillars of uh, key information <clears throat> that must be supported, excuse me. <clears throat> what are the pillars of information that must be communicated to support action? So the first thing in all of your communications materials and conversations with residents, you need to talk about necessity. They want to know, is this even real? Is this urgent? Do I even need to have this conversation right now? Um, past flood experience is a key driver. So people who are in areas who have had flooding before, they are already primed and ready to listen to you. Flood risk mapping. I know that uh, Chris Chopic was asking a question about disclosure before. Um, quite a few municipalities have uh, flood risk maps that they can share with residents and in Ontario conservation authorities. Um, if there are key areas that are at high risk, higher risk of flooding, um, it's very, very helpful to share with people that they are within a zone that puts them at higher risk to, to increase the likelihood that they will act. The next one is responsibility. Is it their problem? Something that we've, you find uh, internationally is that if people think that the government will take care of them, um, someone else, their insurance company will cover it, they, they often don't act. So the key messaging is that we all have a role to play and that people need to acknowledge their personal responsibility and the personal opportunity to protect their homes and that they are partners, they are one piece uh, in the flood protection realm. The huge one is next, it's trust. So if people, people are even looking at, is this necessary, uh, am I responsible, responsible to do it? They're sort of filtering all this information through the trust lens. Is the information that's presented to them even worthy of their, of their time? So what we found, which is quite fascinating, is that residents will check. They will check with uh, conservation authorities. They will check with online sources of information. They will check with Red Cross. Um, they will check with insurance companies about basic information. And what they're looking for is that um, the information is consistent and that uh, everyone's saying the same thing. So they validate it that way. But what we've really found and what is fascinating is that the actual decision-making tipping point, whether or not people will actually act, comes from um, people gathering information from personal conversations with trusted people. And something that I find personally fascinating is the most influential um, conversations you have are with family, friends, and neighbors. So it really showed us as well that residents have a huge role to play in helping protect it, others in their neighborhood and their families because they are they have huge influence on their networks. Advance the slide, please. 
The next one is tricky. Um, residents have to feel once they've gathered all this information, well, can I actually decide which actions are priority that I need to take and do I know how to complete them? So people are looking at their own skill set. They're trying to determine if they can do things. They also want to have the, the priority list co-created with them. People in general don't like to be told, like they're little kids, um, this is what you need to do. You have to do this, you have to do this. They really appreciate, and it's actually quite critical to co-create solutions with them. That's why our assessment program was so successful because people co-created action plans with their assessors. If there is, if they have decided they want to do it, they have the ability, there is also a challenge with access to funds. And so if you can let people know that where funds are available, that's very helpful to them. Final is the, the sort of the grand calculation, the return on investment. Is return on risk, is reducing risk going to be worth the money that I will be spending? It must be reasonable based on all factors above. And people aren't just thinking about money. They're really thinking, like Blair was mentioning earlier, about the stability of home, the safety of their home, their emotional um, well-being and the well-being of family. Um, people who have had a flood, who have close personal contacts with flood understand the significant emotional impacts associated and they would really rather avoid that. So in messaging, it's important to talk about peace of mind as well because people really do value that. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, and the final slide here is just different approaches that we took. We worked with our local partners to decide what were the best approaches that would work for them because every home is different, but also every community is different. And if you want to get something done, you ask the people who are local and who, who know what's going on, who know what works. So we did some citywide marketing with media releases, with print ads and social media ads. What we found is really important, like I was mentioning, is these personal connections, the uh, testimonials. Um, so if you're, if you're putting an ad in, any kind of ad, it's really helpful to feature um, someone who has experienced, a local person who has experienced a flood and has taken action and has reduced their, their flooding um, uh, impacts. And then it encourages people to feel like there's a point, like it's optimistic uh, marketing and it encourages people to take action. It also legitimizes it to the local area. And then I know that everyone has limited time and resources. As a community, you need to determine where are your highest risk areas where are the areas that you need to focus on and target to? So you can do door-to-door -door campaigns, you can do targeted door hangers. Um, ward newsletters have, have shown to be very, very good. Ward councillors, mayors are, are very um, close to community and are, are very strong influencers. Uh, community events in the local community where you can have face-to-face -face conversations are great. And in Saskatoon, they had an interesting idea of using mobile billboards. So if a billboard's sitting too long, it becomes just part of the scenery, like a tree. Um, so what they were doing was they were moving uh, billboards to neighborhoods and different sections of neighborhoods to, to raise awareness. Uh, next slide. Great. Okay, great. Um, okay, Cheryl, we have a couple of questions. I, I would just like to um, have a blanket apology to everyone if I am mispronouncing your name. I am, I am sorry and, and let that last from now until the end of the webinar. Uh, from Margot Shepard, what responsibility does a municipality have to make its residents aware of any flood risk mapping and or risks? Hmm. Well, that is something that a municipality needs to speak with their, with their legal counsel about. Um, there is, um, there have been a variety of different approaches. Um, some municipalities disclose more than others, uh, and that is all evolving. Um, if we look at some, somewhere like Edmonton, 
um, they have they were pushed to disclose and they um, now are some of the leaders in the country they have uh, searchable uh, property level flood risk maps um, they are offering flood risk assessments um, they have great outreach materials um, so it does it does depend on the municipality and you have to work with your your legal counsel your mayors uh, your your counselors to determine what is the appropriate level of disclosure that you're comfortable with right now because there is not a, a blanket requirement for disclosure um, but it's important to look at some of the community leaders who have already made full disclosure um, available and <clears throat> the fact that that has strengthened their housing market it has lent stability and credibility be by being more open uh, and transparent and um, uh, there's a lot more that can be said about that by people that are a lot more experts than I am but uh, that's that's the overall uh, answer okay great uh, another question from Janet I Ivy uh, regarding the most common home flood risks what proportion of the homeowners surveyed had experienced uh, basement flooding oh very interesting um, well, it depended on the community. Um, when we were in Clarington, there were 95% of those people had already ex uh, experienced flooding. Um, in Burlington, we had about, uh, I'd say about 60%. In Saskatoon, we we're at about 55, 60%. Uh, people we know for sure are more interested in doing assessments and taking action if they've already, as Blair likes to say, got religion on the file because they've had a personal experience. Um, the other thing that's a big motivator is if you know someone personally, like if your mom has had a flood or Dan's uh, grandmother has had a terrible flood, you're a lot more aware. Um, and also maybe that person is calling you up and saying, hey, you should take action. Uh, or maybe they gave you a backwater valve for Christmas, you know. Um, so those are those are some of the numbers that we were seeing okay i'm just gonna take one more question if you don't mind um are there any codes to enforce the homeowner to take part um that's beyond my level of expertise right now um particularly in new homes there would be uh codes that that people would have their home um uh, they would have to adhere to at construction. Um, there are some municipal bylaws that would be um, that would be enforced. Um, in in Toronto, there is a, a downspout uh, disconnection bylaw where whereby people are required to disconnect their their bylaw or their downspout or face a fine. So there are different um, levers at point of new construction, different levers at the point of the municipal bylaws. Um, some things are uh, voluntary uh, and some things are required. Great, thank you, Cheryl. I would uh, now like to introduce Daniel Filippi, um, Program Manager, Resilience and Adaptation at the Intact Center. Go ahead, Daniel. Thank you, Corinne, uh, appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> um, Eileen, if you don't mind, the next slide. So what we're going to be talking about today is Cheryl did a great representation of what we've done to date. Um, really, I know she mentioned three years, but now being in 2020, we've kind of come up to four years now, surprisingly, it's gone quick. Uh, but what we've put together based off our research is we wanted to make easily digestible infographics and handouts as well as documents that the average Canadian can use and they can actually understand and then put and implement into action. So what we've done here, this is probably our most popular infographic that uh, some of the people attendees on the call might have seen. Uh, it's one of our pieces we have in our resources page. And we'll post a link to it uh, as well at the end of my talk. Uh, but this is our three steps to cost effective home flood protection. So if you remember those first three slides or uh, graphs that Cheryl put up, it was actually highlighting the different percentages when we went out and did those 510 assessments in Southwestern Ontario as well as Saskatoon about what those top risks were for homeowners. Um, and really this infographic, we always joke, you know, it took 
quote unquote, three years or four years to develop. But the reason it looks so simplified now is we've gone through so many iterations to make it as simple as possible. So what we've done with this is we've made it uh, a three-step way to fully protect your house as best as possible before a big storm hits. Um, we've organized it by priority and cost. So doing it yourself essentially for free, doing it yourself for under $250. And as Cheryl actually touched on previously, something where uh, what happened to my grandmother in Toronto, and I'll get into that example a little bit later, but where a major storm has hit or where, or where homeowners have experienced floods continually or more than once, that's where you're probably bringing an expert, a contractor, licensed plumber to do a little bit more of these more intensive and more costly efforts that are over $250. So it's practical, cost effective, and we've made it available both in English and French. So the links are there. Again, you guys will all receive this at the end. So this will be in the toolkit as well. Next slide, please, Eileen. So what I wanted to do is actually just break down each of these three steps and just show how simple it is to do a lot of these pieces. Um, the great piece when we're talking about step one and maintaining what you've got at least twice a year, um, the big ones here is just general maintenance around the home. Big times to do this or uh, the best kind of thought is to do it at least twice a year. Uh, and it usually coincides, especially around this time of year, spring cleaning. Um, Obviously with what's been going on with COVID-19, you're trying to do as many of these inside the home. And we've tried to make sure that you can do these by yourself in and around your lot only. So you don't have to kind of go off your property. Um, but what we've done here is number one is really removing debris from your nearest storm drain in your community. What's so big about this, and I know it seems very simple. If you've had a major storm in your community, sometimes you'll notice a bunch of water pooling in a, a low depressed area and you'll see that whirlpool starting up. It's because a storm drain is there and it's almost completely blocked and the water's only going down a small portion of that storm drain. So it's a great piece actually, uh, if you can get together with your community and kind of reach out, get in contact with everybody and your neighbors and actually try and start scheduling out each week to make sure those storm drains in your community or on your street are not blocked. So just going out with a push broom, making sure that all the you know leaf detritus, all the other kind of litter that could be uh, piling up as well as any other kind of salt or sand. That's just a very simple thing to do. Number two is really cleaning out your eaves troughs. I know it's everyone's favorite thing to do when it comes to spring cleaning is getting up on a ladder and cleaning your eaves troughs. And it seems simple enough, but this is actually a big piece we've seen for a major risk for a lot of homeowners. Once your eaves troughs are all plugged up with either leaves or we've even actually seen in some homes, small saplings starting to grow out of people's eaves troughs, funny enough, because this is all clogged up, if a major rain event happens, it's overflowing those eaves troughs and it's landing right by the foundation of your home. That's where you're getting a lot of these issues when we're talking about seepage and infiltration. And when we get into the topic of your basement flooding due to one of those issues, mostly the seepage or infiltration, the likelihood that you'll get covered for that claim because it's happening over a long period of time is very low. So it's really important to make sure those are cleared. Maintaining your plumbing fixtures and appliances. Again, another thing that seems simple enough that you should be taking care of but going around the home and making sure those slow leaks are taken care of. And over time, if that keeps happening, it's seen again as something with insurance that that might not be fully covered if you're not maintaining a lot of these pieces around your home. Testing your sub pump. When it comes to testing your sub pump, that was one of the big pieces when Cheryl put up her graphs there. Um, you know, what was the percentage of people who did maintenance on their sub pump? It was only 60%. So 40% of people have never even tested their sub pump before. And when we go and give talks, we say to people who do have a sub pump, what is, how do you actually do it? The simplest way is actually just getting a bucket of water, slowly pouring it into the pit where the sub pump is, making sure that the float level comes up, clicks on, and you hear the motor start running and it pushes the water out, out into your outflow uh, across your lawn. This is a big piece, obviously, to start worrying about and making sure the motor is running properly and soundly before you have a major event and you're looking in your basement and that pit's filling up and you don't hear that, you know, that noise, which is the most important noise to hear in a major rainstorm. And finally, backwater valves aren't as uh, widespread and common right now as they should be. Uh, but for people who do have them, a backwater valve, very similar to cleaning out your toilet, you're going in there with a toilet brush, you're cleaning it out because you've got to think everything you're flushing down your toilet is actually passing through these backwater valves. And the way they effectively work is they have a flap on them and they 
close when any water is coming in the wrong direction. So again, a sewage backup, and that will actually create a seal there. So you wanna make sure that flap can move uh, freely and you're cleaning out anything going on there. Wipes, fat, oil, and grease obviously shouldn't be flushed down, but making sure you're cleaning that out if it's stuck and congealed inside your backwater valve. And the other major thing to talk about is because it's on your sewer lateral, you have to remember you're having sewer gas go through that lateral as well. So you will actually want to be checking when you open up the lid to do maintenance at least twice a year, that you make sure the gasket actually doesn't have any cracks because you don't want that seal broken. So you should be purchasing uh, additional seals as well and gaskets to make sure that you have a, a proper seal on that. Next slide. So this is when you're going into your do it yourself or over a weekend thing. A, little, uh, a few of these things are a little bit more intensive, but again, you can easily do it by yourself. Tons of YouTube videos out there that actually walk you through how to do this properly. And a lot of them are fairly self-explanatory. Number one is installing window well covers. So if you have below grade windows and making sure that you don't want an inadverted fish tank outside of your basement window, you should be looking into installing a window well cover to stop rainwater from filling up in that window well, especially if the drain in your window well gets clogged up, which also should be cleaned out regularly. Window well covers, very cheap to purchase at your local hardware store, you know, ranging between about $30 to $50 Canadian, and they can be adhered uh, to, the, to the side of your house through the brick and mortar, and they stay on there, and they prevent rain from getting into your window wells and, pre and preventing likely overland or seepage flow getting into your basement causing a flood. Number two, extending your downspouts or sub-discharge. Cheryl mentioned this in Toronto, this is now part of their bylaw where if you have, or if you've seen on your home, uh, your downspout actually disappears into the ground, it's connected to your storm lateral and it's contributing into a combined sewer. So what you should be doing is cutting that if, and obviously checking with your municipality first, because they all have different requirements, check with your municipality first. Some may actually cover this in a municipal subsidy, or they might actually provide a service that comes by and does it themselves. But you should be making sure that if you have it cut, it should not be depositing water right beside the foundation of your home. You should be extending that out. And those downspout extensions, again, 20 to about $40 to purchase, and you can make sure that water isn't depositing and staying beside the foundation of your home and seeping into your basement walls. Number three, you wanna be storing your valuables and hazardous materials in watertight containers, or simply removing them from the basement, or at least placing them up high. Uh, a lot of this paint, bare things, all these pieces, if you have uh, a flood in your basement, you don't want that water mixing with any kind of noxious materials and making your house also you know, uninhabitable for longer than it needs to be, regardless of whether you have water in your basement or not. So that's a big piece that you've got to make sure is protected. Number four, funny enough, and this was our lowest percentage, but still you know, an eye-popping percentage to say the least. Uh, when we did our study through the Home Flood Protection Program, we noticed that 35% of the people we went out to actually had an obstruction of their floor drain. This is the kind of last call or last line of defense where water is going to be draining from your basement. You want to make sure it's clear. We actually had people completely tile over it, completely cover it with carpet or whatever. And that, when you have a sewer backup, guess where that water is coming up first? You're going to have to replace all that flooring. So you want to make sure, number one, you're not covering a floor drain. But number two, you have a lot of people who just kind of have their kids' toys over it, hockey bags, things like that. You want to make sure there's a a path towards that, because you'll notice where your floor drain is in your basement, it'll concave and actually slope towards it. So if there is water, if there is a basement flood, it can at least leave in that exit. And number five, installing and maintaining flood alarms. So this is actually a pretty interesting piece. This has really been coming out the last five years or so, I would say it's been fairly popular. But flood alarms, uh, by and large, can be fairly cheap. You know, can start a simply kind of pucks that you would place on, uh, on the ground near a major appliance like your washer or dryer or by your sink or toilet. If there's any kind of leakage, they'll emit uh, an audible alarm. Now, you can actually go higher and get into the hundreds of dollars. You can actually have it hooked up and Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, we've seen a lot of these products before and worked with some of these other companies who've been developing these pieces. But essentially, you're not home all the time. Um, so when you're out at work, you're out on vacation, you actually know and you will get an alert on your phone 
hey, there's a water leak, it's been detected, you can at least hopefully get either your kids or someone else to check on that issue before it becomes a major issue. So again, flood alarms, maintain them and purchasing them. There's a wide variety of those on the market. Next slide, please. Step three, and this is what I was talking about, completing more complex upgrades. So these are for people who, you know, whether you've had a basement flood or not, but this is where it's coming into, you know, you've exhausted a lot of the more simpler resources, a lot of the things that you can do by yourself. And this is where you're trying to bring in a contractor or someone in a specialized field who's uh, accredited to help with a lot of these works. And one of these is installing window wells that sit 10 to 15 centimeters above ground. So again, if you have a below grade window, you want to make sure those metal drums around it, protecting water from getting in there, are actually sitting up that 10 to 15 centimeters above the ground to make sure you're not getting overflow in there. Coupled with window well covers, that's making sure that those likely entry points aren't going to be potential points where flood water is going to be getting into your home and you're better protecting it. But again, excavating those old ones out and placing in new ones, it's a lot of work. It's going to take some man hours, so you're actually going to have to bring someone in to help you with that. I talked about this before by cutting, disconnecting your downspout, uh, capping the foundation drains, and then extending those downspouts out at least two meters from the home. Again, there's various programs out there. Um, I know, for example, in Windsor, it's actually covered by the municipality in Windsor, Ontario. So they will actually come to your house. They've, I think they've stated it's about $430 for the service but they will come to your house if you're an at-risk person, you've had a basement flood before, they will cut it, cap the connection down to the storm lateral and weeping tiles, and they'll actually extend it out for you. Meanwhile, if you're doing it by yourself and your municipality says it's okay to do so, you've gotten word from the municipality, again, it's a fairly cheap piece because you're only purchasing those extending pieces out, but you may get, have to get permits to actually do this work. So check with your municipality first with this piece is a, a major thing to consider. Number three, correcting grading around, uh, around your home and making sure water is getting two meters away from the foundation. This is another thing we saw that I think on the graphs before it was around that 63 to 65% range. Homeowners actually had either very level ground beside the foundation of their home or over time, if they have a garden bread or just depressions of water sitting there, it's actually had water pooling beside the foundation of the home. So actually regrading your entire property you're gonna to have to get fresh soil in, you're gonna to have to get a landscaping crew to help out with that. It's a lot of work and a lot of money to do. If it's around specific around the foundation of your home, it's a little bit cheaper, but that's something that should be considered because if water's gonna be pooling there, again, you're having that infiltration occurrence occurring again and again. And if we're gonna be tying it to sub pumps, you're actually gonna be burning through your sub pumps life expectancy a lot quicker because it's just gonna be cycling that water through the seepage into the, tile, into the weeping tiles and your sub pump's gonna be kicking that out again. And it's gonna be working when really it should be saving itself for a major rate of it. Number four, installing a backwater valve. Now backwater valves as themselves, and as Cheryl mentioned, make a great Christmas gift. So I will advocate for that, absolutely. But number two, backwater valves by themselves, when you purchase them from a hardware store, they're really not that expensive. They're, they're about $350 to purchase. Now granted, that's a small price, but when we're talking about actually getting them fitted by a licensed contractor and you're gonna need a licensed plumber to fit them on your lateral, it's a lot more because you're paying for their time to do that work um, and their labor. Now, a lot of municipalities, as I mentioned before, they will cover costs up to this. Uh, examples I've seen in several provinces, they're around $1,200 that will cover up to the service because you actually have to break through the concrete of your, uh, of your home to the foundation of your home, get down to the lateral, once the lateral is seen, you have a plumber come in, they will cut that sewer lateral themselves and then fit this mainline backwater valve on it and actually make sure the flow of water is still escaping from the home and it's not just depositing underneath uh, the foundation of your home and then you're getting sinkhole issues or something crazy like that. So obviously you need the experts to come in and help with this kind of work. Uh, overall, these costs can be a few thousands of dollars. It seems like something that you know, is ex extremely expensive but again, if your municipality can afford this and they can help subsidize a lot of these costs, this is a major thing that should be considered. And uh, last but not least, installing a, installing a backup sub pump and battery. So there's a wide array of different batteries that you can purchase and use. Um, and they can be used to you know, quick recharge batteries. They have enough juice. You're not losing power over time. 
uh, because you want to have your main sub pump. It's going to be connected uh, to an electrical socket. But what happens when there's a major rainstorm? What's usually accompanied with that? A lot of times, it's a thunder. It's a thunderstorm, and sometimes uh, the power can go go out, or you have major uh, wind effects coming in, knocking down hydro poles. So you want to have a backup power supply. Now you can also have this connected to a generator as well, and this is what other people have. And then having a secondary or even tertiary sub pump is something that a lot of homeowners have considered if they know that they are in a high risk area to make sure their basement doesn't flood. So again, when we're talking about over $250, you're exceeding up into the thousands with some of these actions. But when it comes to municipal subsidies, if there are some available in your area, you can take advantage of these. And secondly, when we're talking about insurance, if you're installing a couple of these or planning to install a couple of these actions, reach out to your insurance provider first because we've noted that several insurers will actually provide a discount on your annual premium if you install a couple of these things. So having that open conversation with your insurance provider and finding out what they can offer can also at least soften the blow with some of these more expensive pieces. Um, the example that Cheryl shared with everybody before with my grandmother in Toronto, she has a block foundation. So naturally there's already crevices in between those blocks and over time uh, mortar is going to be deteriorating, you're going to have water flowing into the basement. So she had a constant and chronic seepage and infiltration issue. We actually had to completely uh, dig out around the foundation of the home, excavate out there. And that cost was $20,000 to actually waterproof and put a waterproof membrane around the basement. Now granted, $20,000 sounds like a lot of money, but it was cheap because I was able to do a lot of the labor uh, as well as my father. So again, that's the low level when we're talking about major extremes and you want to make sure you're doing a lot of these preventive measures ahead of time before you get to something more extreme, uh, such as that example. Next slide, please. This is another thing we like to put out. Uh, it's a great resources for homeowners and residents alike. Uh, we want to talk about water damage insurance coverages. So when we're talking about flood insurance, a lot of people go, yeah, I have flood insurance. Generally, when you have flood insurance, though, it's not covering all of these different types of sources of water damage that can come into your home. When you're talking about likely flood insurance, you probably have plumbing and fixtures uh, protection if there's, a, if there's an accidental rupture in one of your plumbing fixtures in the home. When we're talking about sewer backup, overland water flow, groundwater or seepage infiltration, and then water and sewer lines, these are generally all optional coverages unless your provider provides something like an enhanced water damage package. But again, you have to be making sure when you're looking at your coverage that you're making sure that you have coverage for all these other pieces because generally they're gonna be optional coverages. So when we're talking about sewer backup, water flowing into your home from the combined sewer, that's gonna be an optional coverage you're gonna to have to purchase. Overland water, Overland water coverage has really only been available in Canada the last five to seven years. So because it's a newer coverage, and again, it's dependent on whether you're deemed in a high risk area or not, you might not even be able to purchase this coverage, but this is something that should be looked into if it's a concern for your home. Because if it's an overland water issue where you're getting flooded out and you don't have that coverage, the likelihood is you're obviously not gonna make, be able to make a successful claim. When we're talking about groundwater infiltration, generally this isn't covered. Several groups and insurance providers will actually provide this type of coverage. But again, it has to be accidental. It can't be a chronic piece. So uh, in my example with my grandmother, we couldn't get coverage for that because it was chronic. It was every spring, you would see efflorescence along the brick there. You actually couldn't get coverage for that piece. So if it's an accidental or sudden, you can get this type of coverage, but it's a little harder to see. Water and sewer line rupture and coverage, that is out there as well. It'll cover up to a certain amount, say ten to $15,000. And it's dependent on where that rupture is. If it's off your property, the town or municipality should be paying for it. And if it's closer to your home, you're gonna be responsible for that. A lot of times tree roots, all these other pieces can get in and that's what can be causing a blockage or uh, a subsequent rupture. So again, making sure you're talking with your provider about all these different types of water dams is something really pertinent to making sure you feel comfortable and fully protected from various types of water damage. Next slide, please. So this is a great actual uh, tool we put together over the past year. So it's our online, it's called our Home Flood uh, Protection Checkup Tool. So what we've done is we've put together and really digitized our three steps document. 
Um, this is a great piece we put together because we really wanted the average Canadian homeowner to either pull up their phone, pull up their tablet, you know, use their laptop or desktop at home and go through a very easy yes or no kind of question and answer about where they're protected around their home uh, and how they could do better to protect their home. So really the checkups, it takes only about five to 10 minutes to complete. Again, you're answering simple yes or no questions. If you actually say no to some of these questions about, for example, do you have a disconnected downspout? It'll, it'll actually provide the recommended piece uh, and why it's so important to make a change in that area. Um, so it's a great piece if you're saying, no, I haven't done that yet. It actually provides feedback about how you should do it and the importance of that uh, to make sure you're taking that action. It then actually provides a confidential and tailored report. So based on your answers, yes or no, it provides you an action-focused checklist that you can work on uh, after you've completed the assessment. So you can get this email directly to you after you complete it, or you can simply download the PDF. And it, on it, it provides a list of local subsidies for major municipalities across Canada. It provides a list of insurance discounts for taking action. So we have little pieces that say I or S, saying if you take this action, the likelihood is you could get an insurance discount with this, or there may be a local subsidy in your area that can at least provide some sort of financial benefit for installing this action. Um, and then we also provide links to third party videos that Cheryl and I have created at the center um, that actually show you and run through how to do maintenance on a couple of these uh, pieces in your home if you haven't done them yet. And again, we provide this in both official languages, so it's a bilingual tool uh, that you can use with homeowners. And we'll just do a quick run through. I'll show you kind of how it looks online. So Eileen, if you don't mind helping me out here. So this is how the web page looks if you're going to be pulling it up on your computer or home flood protection checkup. Um, and I'll just get you to scroll down there, uh, Eileen, and you can just click get started there. And again, when we're talking about information, we don't want detailed information from you. We just want city, province, or territory, and then whether you have a basement or a cross space, uh, and if you own or you lease your, uh, your area of residence, because this actually provides tailored questions towards you. So that's the only reason we're collecting this information. We don't collect any other information from this or share it with any other third party groups. So we start with flood protection tips for outside your home. You just click next there, Eileen. Thank you. And you see, we start with storm drains. Do you remove debris from nearby storm drains or your ditch and culverts on a regular basis? Uh, if you go no, You'll get a pop-up that actually states this is why it's important to do so. You're preventing high water levels and you're providing uh, less likelihood of water flowing onto your neighbors or your own uh, property. Next question. Do you have any exterior fuel or chemical storage tanks? You click no. Do your downspouts deposit water onto the surface of the ground? No or yes. And you just go through. Um, we won't go through the whole thing just for, you know, uh, the essence of time here. So what I'll do is I'll get Eileen, if you don't mind, just pulling up the finalized report if you were to go through and essentially how it would look for a user. So when you finish the assessment, this is what spits out the final report. So you'll get this email to yourself if you opt in for the email, or you can have this simply downloaded to your computer. So it states where you're from, you have a basement or crawl space, do you own it, yes or no? And then here at the top, you'll see actions already completed in the home. Uh, and you'll notice the I uh, saying may qualify for insurance discounts and S may qualify for municipal subsidies. So you go through and you actually see checks. This is what you're already doing good and what you're doing well around the home. And as you scroll down, you'll see, uh, you'll get to a section that are essentially things that provide you a checklist. Um, yeah, keep going, please. Here you go, sorry, just up, uh, yeah, right there. And then we have future actions to consider to reduce flood risk. And it's actually based off, again, our three steps document, and it breaks it into those steps. So you can actually budget your money and time and resources to see you can complete simple upgrades doing yourself for under $250 with the window wells uh, and the window well covers, along with grading and other pieces. 
And as you see, when we're scrolling down, Eileen's scrolling down here, you'll see some of them like protecting belongings, I. You actually can qualify for insurance discounts if you can provide, to your, uh, if you can provide actual evidence to your provider that you have these installed or you have water alarms installed. And now with some of these, we actually have how-to videos and those link to some of the maintenance pieces we've created to show you how to properly use them and maintain a lot of these resources. So thanks very much, Eileen. I'll get you to go back to the presentation now. And again, this is another resource provided to all you guys because you're here in attendance. This will be part of the toolkit as well, so you have uh, access to this as well. And next slide, please. And so this is what we're talking about when we come to home flood protection links and how-to videos. Um, I used up my 15 minutes of fame here with creating these videos, so please be kind. I hope you guys enjoy them. But these are really how you can go across when we're talking about major maintenance pieces uh, of what you can do around your home and how you can maintain these very integral implementable actions to make sure before a flood that they're working to their best available capacity. So we have an introduction and then we highlight how to do maintenance of your backwater valves if you have them, how to do maintenance of your sub pump if you have them, uh, how the flood alarms work and different options of flood alarms, uh, how when you're disconnecting a downspout and extending it and different options out there. The major thing actually, which is just kind of an aside, we notice when people extend their downspouts, a lot of people actually get upset about the fact that they have to disconnect them again when they're mowing the lawn. They get in the way where your kids are tripping over them and they're a fall hazard. So there's a lot of new um, extensions that actually have a hinge. So you can just simply close it when you're doing any kind of activities outside or you're having people over, and then you can lay them back down. So there's hinge downspouts at your local uh, hardware stores that you can install as well. So all these pieces we kind of go through with the videos and that's a great piece there that we touch on. Uh, next slide, please. And I think that's it for me. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Daniel. We have a number of questions here. Um, before we take the questions, I just wanna remind everyone to check the uh, chat box and the Q&A box because a number of the attendees have typed comments or observations and questions, and then some of you have answered questions that have been posed. So uh, just a reminder to uh, take a look at that. Uh, we have a question from Jack Brandt. Does building code for residences allow for sub pumps to be installed outside of the basement as opposed to inside? With proper insulation, it is unlikely they would freeze with depth. Well, again, that really depends on the municipality and it's gonna also depend on the province. Uh, from my knowledge, uh, I believe like a lot of places in Manitoba, you're getting that deep freeze. Sub pump systems aren't usually gonna be allowed outside. Uh, a lot of times when there's a major flood event, you're going to have pump systems that can be purchased, uh, you know, at a major rental store and you can be pumping that out when the current is already uh, happening and a major event is already happening. Uh, but to my knowledge, there's not many building codes that are going to be allowing sub pumps to be installed generally outside because we are a four season country. The majority of them are going to be indoors. So you're not getting that freeze potential and because you're having the frost level go uh, only so it's, you know, it's happening fairly shallow. So the effects of what could happen with a sub pump system outside in freezing temperatures that are lasting in a majority of the province across this country for at least three to four months, uh, I hazard a guess that many municipalities do not have those types of building codes. Now, granted, if it's for a commercial property and they have more insulation properties and uh, they can do it for a larger, uh, a larger parcel of land and there's a majority of them, that might be something where it's more allowable. Uh, but that's the best of my knowledge. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, from Sky, what are the available systems uh, that residences have to adopt in terms of technology to receive the auto alerts in advance? Sure. So there's a number of different uh, devices that you can purchase when it comes to alarm systems. Um, I'm not going to actually provide any specific and kind of uh, actual companies that provide it. But if you do a quick search online, um, you can find a couple of them. Um, the, major, the majority of them uh, are either fitted, so I didn't even actually touch on this, so Sky, thanks for this question. There's actually flood alarms that can be placed in your backwater valve and can be placed in your sub pump pit. 
Um, and the sub pump pit, uh, those type of alarms are actually acoustic devices. So the minute they see the water level start uh, being uh, inactive because the pump's most likely on at that time and the acoustic signal is sending down, you'll get an alert on your phone that your sub pump is actually activated at that point. Now granted, when you're paying for these systems, this is where you're getting into the few hundreds of dollars. But depending where you're located, Sky, I would suggest checking with your municipality first to see. I know, for example, in Toronto, they cover up to 85% of the total cost of a flood alarm uh, system, up to, I believe, about uh, 1125 Canadian. Um, so again, checking that first, if you want to purchase a couple more of these more expensive systems, uh, for example, if you have a backwater valve, the flood alarm system you can have in there, it's two metal prongs that sit inside the backwater valve. And as regular flow goes through, no water is going to be touching that. But if there's a backup with sewage water, it will fill up the mainline backwater valve and those prongs will sit in the water, activate either an audible alarm or again, you can purchase a more expensive system where it can be tied to Wi-Fi and you get push notifications. So you know, hey, the backwater valve is closed. If your kids are at home or if any other family member is home, you call them right away and say, listen, don't use the toilet don't use the sink because we're actually going to flood ourselves. That's the major thing we were talking about backwater valves. The minute that valve is up, you can actually flood yourself and that water's coming back up your own pipes and flooding you out. Now, granted, my kind of piece when I'm talking about backwater valves, I would prefer my own potential waste backing up into my home than all my neighbor's waste backing up into my home. That's just my personal preference. So if we're talking about the potential that is there where you can flood yourself, again, the, the risk is a lot uh, is a lot less if you have a backwater valve installed. But having flood alarm systems like that, uh, you can have a bunch of them tethered. So you can have a puck sitting beside major appliances like your washer dryer, like your toilet, uh, near the shower even. And then those are all tethered on one network. But again, there's a lot of different groups out there. If you do just a simple Google search, I guarantee you should be able to find a couple. We know of a couple different Canadian brands that you can get in touch with. Um, so again, if this is offline and, and personal, I can probably provide some if you can't find any. Uh, but thank you for the question. Okay, uh, at this point, we're gonna move along to Cheryl Evans, the Director of uh, Home Flood Protection again, uh, to finish off the presentation. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thank you, Corinne. So you can advance the slide, please. Okay, so now we get down to the final portion of the presentation. And this section is talking about how we can work with you um, to help raise awareness and support action of your residents to, uh, to protect their homes from flooding. So the major thing that you will receive um, in the email, the follow-up email after this webinar, is the Home Flood Protection Toolkit. So of all of the resources that we've been asked for, that we've custom built for communities over the last few years, we put the key resources uh, that we've found are in high demand and are of interest to municipalities um, and community groups and businesses. We put them into this toolkit. So what is inside? Essentially yesterday, um, Dan put together um, a, um, some links, but also some PDFs that you can just download um, automatically and, and start to use them. The, the first one, which is the most popular, is the three steps, three steps to cost-effective home flood protection. We have one version that just has our logos that you can share. We have another version where you can actually add your municipality or your business's logo. Um, and the document called Understanding Water Damage Insur Insurance Coverages, that infographic that Dan was mentioning, we've also got an option now um, to include your municipality's logo or um, your business logo. And something I wanted to really note about that document is that what we really found is so common is that residents really have a hard time even understanding the basic purpose of insurance. Um, they didn't understand, for example, uh, which is covered on this critical infographic, that if they don't, that, that insurance is to cover sudden and accidental uh, losses of water in this case. Um, and that essentially, if it can be proven that you have not done your maintenance, um, your insurance may not apply. 
Or for example, if you're away from home for a long period of time and have not been doing your caregiving duties, um, your insurance may not apply either. So this is what uh, something that's really critical that this, this information conveys. And you'll also notice that anywhere on our information, we've already always started with maintenance because that is really, um, really critical. If you're not doing your maintenance, that's not, you're not doing your first line of def defense. And frankly, you may not uh, qualify for insurance. Um, the next is the link to the live home flood protection checkup tool. Um, all of these top three are available in English and en français as, as well. And the more demand we get for these materials, the more uh, we will translate into French. We have uh, a variety of do-it-yourself checklists. Some the a recent one um, that came from a request from Red Cross is to have a conversation guide between uh, landlords and tenants to talk about what's their responsibility, uh, what, which each responsibility is to help, um, to help really communicate and to help protect homes and help people feel comfortable. We've got some inst instructional how-to videos. We also have a really interesting um, social media uh, toolkit in itself which includes not only sample posts, but it also has all of the infographics that we've created and graphics that we've created that you can take and download and adapt them and put them, uh, use your own logos, uh, use them as part of videos, um, adapt them for your own purposes. Our goal is not to, um, to hoard this information and say, oh, it's mine, it's mine, I'm not gonna share with you. Um, our goal is to get the information out there. So all we ask is that you just uh, give us uh, some credit for the original content. And also there are a variety of other resources, for example, um, information about uh, the subsidies that are available across Canada to reduce your flood, to um, install uh, measures that can protect your home from flooding. Advance the slide, please. This is just a little, um, um, a little push for the social media uh, campaigns. Uh, we know that getting information out right now, there are, are limitations because of social distancing to what we can do to engage people face-to-face. -face. It's a very challenging time for people. And like we said again, people are looking for information they can trust. So if you're putting out really simple, cost-effective posts, and they're being put out by people who are trusted. So by realtors, by um, community groups, by municipalities, by EMS. Um, and then those are being shared on by residents um, to those networks of people that they care most about. This can really have a lot of big pickup and it's, it's critically important. The nice thing about social media, of course, is it, it is conversational. Um, so you get uh, a dialogue going. And like I said before, all of this is about being respectful and co-creating solutions. So having collaborative conversations, um, even if it is through a distance, through social, social media, it can be very effective and certainly is extremely cost effective. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, what, what we're suggesting is that essentially um, local municipalities local um, insurance companies, local realtors, local residents, you are the local experts in your communities. You know what you want, you know that how messaging needs to be adapted slightly to really resonate and inspire action in your residents. We have a variety of uh, basic resources and we have uh, social media posts that we will be sharing through Twitter and through Facebook but we really encourage you to think about how you can tailor this information um, to really resonate with residents and we are here to help with that. And also we've found the, the most amazing experiences we've had working in communities are not the, the pats on the back, people saying, oh, that's great. We love everything you've created. We love it when they say, have you thought about including this? Have you thought about building this? Um, in response, we've, we've recently started translating our materials into French, but we're also starting uh, to translate them into the top seven languages uh, in Toronto, for example. So as, 
as the requests uh, for support come in, we build new resources or we do new research. We are a research center. Um, essentially, we take questions and um, we respond to questions. So I really encourage you to continue the dialogue with Daniel and I and with Blair. And uh, we're here to help. Um, can you please advance the slide? Okay, so after the webinar, um, in a couple of days, you'll receive the Home uh, Flood Protection Toolkit that's fo focused on community-based approaches you can take uh, to support residents. And also, you'll be provided with um, outreach or the contact information for myself and Daniel. I focus on um, outreach materials, developing new content, um, collaborating with communities to do to do problem solving. And uh, in fact, Daniel's Daniel helps with that, of course, uh, and is great at it. Um, and, but he's also a specialist in developing courses for community members, so business leaders. Um, uh, as well as municipal leaders. So if you'd like to reach out to him about any of those inquiries, we'd be thrilled to help. And the last piece is because we are an applied research center, what that means is we're always doing on the ground learning and putting one thing out um, is never good enough. We always want to receive feedback to find out what the impacts have been, because like Blair said in the beginning, if we're not making an impact, we're not doing our job. So um, the assessments that were originally done, we got feedback at three and six months. The uh, self-assessments, the checkup, everyone has an opportunity to help with research, to, um, to participate in a one-month follow-up survey to let us know what you've done, where you got stuck, and where you need additional help. So we're gathering that research all across the country. And what we're asking is if municipalities and um, community groups and EMS uh, and other uh, businesses as well, would like to participate in this activity, this exercise of supporting resident action to protect homes from flooding. What we would love if you would participate in a simple follow-up survey for us um, in December to share what your approaches were, what your impacts were, what you learned and what you would recommend to others because we're not doing this just to do it. We're doing it to help, we're doing it to learn, and we're doing it to always do better. Um, so I think with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Corinne. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, uh, now we will be using the last 20 minutes for the panelists to answer questions from the participants. If there isn't enough time to respond to all your questions, you will have the opportunity to continue the dialogue with the presenters via email following the webinar. Um, and I'm just going to go back to some earlier questions that were raised by some participants. Uh, Nick Kellett asked Blair, uh, said there was a CBC article by Neil McDonald last year suggesting that updated floodplain maps will be provided by the federal government this year. Is that initiative still on track? Uh, yes, the initiative is on track. Uh, the up, the uh, updated flood risk maps for Canada will come out through, through a combined effort of uh, Natural Resources Canada and Public Safety Canada starting uh, towards the end of this year and into next year. And uh, the maps will be presented in such a format that they will be hopefully, or this is the intent, they will be very user friendly, easy to interpret. So the short answer is yes, we're, we are on track. Great, and there was also a question from Roberto Figueroa. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, should home insurers have a similar role to the one that you explained earlier, Blair, for realtors? Absolutely, and as a matter of fact, we work very, very closely with the Insurance Brokers Association of Canada, or IBAC, and we are currently, so this is a theoretical construct, this is happening right now, we've developed, uh, meeting in tax center over the course of the last couple of years, if, uh, a climate change and home flood protection training program for insurance brokers in Canada, uh, for which they get continuing education credits. It's a five part series, 15 minutes per segment that the uh, insurance brokers can, can complete on their own uh, online. 
and the uh, currently uh, it is being rolled out to approximately 38,000 insurance brokers across Canada. Several thousand have now taken the course. It was uh, released or initiated starting uh, maybe a couple of months ago. In and, February. And, and basically what it does is it puts the insurance broker in a very good situation to sit, well, perhaps with social distancing, slight adjustment, but the metaphoric equivalent of sitting across the kitchen table and having a discussion with the homeowner about climate change, extreme weather risk, flood risk, and by the way, here are things you can do around the outside of your property and in the basement itself to protect your property from uh, basement flooding and to put it all in very user-friendly form. So that is all underway right now. And by the way, it's not just with uh, real estate agents and insurance brokers, we're also doing very, very similar work with uh, mortgage professionals. So that when you purchase a home, you will be given guidance by the mortgage provider on things you can do around your home to protect your investment from flooding. Great. Uh, here's a question from Brad Nickerson that I'm interested in as well. Are the resources explaining best practices for shoreline erosion protection from flooding with strong wave action? Um, Brad, I'm not sure where you are, but we were actually planning on having uh, a workshop on just this topic in the Antigonish area. Um, perhaps it'll be rescheduled in the fall if things change, but I'll let the panelists go ahead and answer that. Uh, I can take that. The the uh, 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 not that I want to talk all the time, but the uh, the uh, one document we have called "Weathering the Storm" gives fairly good guidance on uh, aspects of flood risk protection along shorelines. But right now, uh, we are engaged, meaning the Intact Center with the uh, National Research Council and the Standards Council of Canada, to create a coastline resiliency standard for Canada. Uh, this will be ocean coastlines, not uh, inland. And uh, uh, so this will be completed probably over the next uh, two years. In reference to uh, sea level rise combined with king tides, combined with storm surges, uh, the area of the Maritimes, and particularly Nova Scotia, is at a fairly great risk. It is the, the area is at highest risk for Canada, lesser so on the West Coast and not uh, problematic uh, at all in the Arctic region because the land is bouncing up there. But uh, this will be developed over the next couple of years, uh, probably two years, coastline resiliency standard or guideline. And then um, it hasn't been done yet, but I think where Canada is also heading is we need another coastline resiliency standard for uh, particularly the Great Lakes um, mm -hmm. and, and rising water in and around the Great Lakes. So all of this stuff is a, a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, we're about, you know, so that's where we're heading. Um, there was another general question from Alex uh, Organ. Um, Daniel answered it, but I think it's an important one. Um, it's a general question. He says he works for, as an emergency management planning officer for indigenous community in Nova Scotia, looking specifically at prevention and mitigation. He's wondering if you have any resources that have been developed that look specifically at indigenous communities. Yeah, and I, I responded to this to, to Alex and um, I could put it out to the rest of the people. I think it went to all attendees as well. So pardon me, I'm a little, I'm a little rusty with the webinar chat function on here. But um, yeah, CMHC, Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, they actually put out uh, great resources. They have a homepage that you can go through. We personally at the Intex Center haven't done any, uh, anything in that realm as of yet, uh, but it's something that's of interest to us. Uh, but the CMHC homepage is a great resource to start. It, it not only talks about flooding and preventative measures to take ahead of time, but also the restorative factor and how to deal with mold uh, in different communities. So that's a great starting point. Uh, and I believe there's a case study um, near Sydney, Nova Scotia. Um, I would have to go into details. I, I know it's somewhere on my, uh, on my uh, computer, on the hard drive somewhere. If I can wrestle that up, um, for those interested, our, our emails will actually just be posted briefly after we're done talking. You can reach out to me, and if I can find that, I'll send out to anyone else who's interested. I just got to wrestle that up from somewhere in my downloads folder. Great. I think there's probably quite a bit of interest in that uh, amongst our Indigenous leaders in Nova Scotia, so perhaps this is a conversation that we can, that we can take forward. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. 
what municipality, uh, what should municipalities do to improve the existing flood response strategy such that more places can be taken care of during floods? I, I can take that. The, um, I think there's, there's two basic steps that need to be engaged. Uh, number one, communities should be going through a prior, prioritization process to identify within the community, where are the areas at higher risk of flooding? And in the document, uh, Weathering the Storm, there's, the, there's a process outlined in there, a very simple 10 step process to identify areas at higher or lower risk in communities uh, relative to flood risk. And it relates to such issues as a history of flooding in the area, the age of the community and, and, and a variety of other measures, all of which are easily answerable probably by most municipal engineers or, or, or managers. Uh, once the process of prioritization is a prioritization has been established and you know where the higher risk areas are within the uh, community, then you can look at the strategic positioning of uh, berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, bioswales, permeable surfacing to direct water to safe locations or hold it back from areas that you otherwise don't want it uh, to come into, but use the prioritization process as a, as a direction as to where these uh, measures should be put in place. And then ultimately when well placed, um, it should be that any holes, li almost literal holes that are left in the system that could affect flood risk could be filled with sandbags. But rather than sandbags being the first line of attack, they should be the last point of resource. So, um, so the, the, the direction is certainly there for communities to use to, to prioritize, flood, prioritize flood risk and then put the measures in place to limit the probability of flooding. And certainly as soon as you have that prioritized, you can work with your community leaders and, and residents uh, to raise awareness, help to reduce risk at the lot level and really to identify where those vulnerable people are that will really need special help um, and uh, provide that, uh, provide a plan um, and emergency evacuation routes, uh, um, make sure that people um, understand that they, what the, what the process will be, um, but prioritize the, um, the, the training uh, and the community supports in those, those areas that um, are at higher risk, uh, get them ready ahead of time and ready to, uh, to, to evacuate if necessary. Okay, we have another question from Sky. What should municipalities do to improve the existing flood response strategy so that more places can be taken care of during floods? I believe we just answered that one, Corinne. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm a little bit behind here. I'm trying to keep <laughs> track of everything. Uh, could you comment on the sewer line problems wrong slope or leaks that are discovered when black flow, uh, backflow valves are installed? What percentage of homeowners have experienced the need for repairs or replacements of sewer lines and how much uh, should they cost? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the issues when people talk about backwater valves. Um, the other major issue is just maintenance. Uh, there are some, you know, we've reached out to some uh, plumbers and they've stated uh, a couple of them are a little hesitant to recommend to some homeowners because they're worried the maintenance isn't going to be kept up. But when we're talking about the sewer lines in question, uh, if they're actually sloping toward the house a little bit or they're kind of more uh, at a, a fairly consistent uh, lateral level, um, it's again, it's a case by case basis. It's, uh, we don't have the exact percentages and numbers where that's actually occurring. Um, but again, when we're talking about backwater valves, we're talking about sub pumps, there's always a case by case basis that needs to be taken with these. But by and large, backwater valves are an important piece that should be installed in homes. And generally, you're seeing in some municipalities, uh, there are bylaws enacted where new builds are actually required to have a backwater valve placed on the sewer lateral. So within that, you know right away that because it's enacted ahead of a new build, they're making sure the, those laterals are on a specific level of slope, uh, right level of percentage towards the sewer lateral, uh, or sorry, the combined sewer system or the separated uh, sewer system uh, to make sure that those issues don't occur where you're just having, if there is a backup, you're not having sewage just sit there and there's potential deterioration occurring. 
Uh, but again, it's a case by case basis. I'm not even sure if anyone has a specific percentage on the uh, on the number where a lot of these occurrences have occurred, but it has popped up from time and uh, uh, time and time, uh, kind of uh, on a case by case basis. Pardon me. Um, but again, in my personal uh, opinion, I think a lot of the opinions about water valves is a, a great resource to use to make sure you're not having a forty-three thousand uh, dollar basement claim being made uh, or forty-three thousand uh, dollar cleanup being made after an event occurs. And that is why it's really critically important to work with your municipality to get permits um, to and to work with plumbers. Um, for example, many municipalities would not give you uh, a permit and would certainly not give you uh, the, the very generous subsidy that's often available to install these if you have not already disconnected your downspouts, for example, um, if, the, if the sewer lateral is in poor condition. Um, if, uh, if the angle of the, the sewer lateral is not adequate. Um, and so by working with your municipality and your plumber, it helps you to determine if the backwater valve is right for you. Um, and if, uh, if this is something that's actually appropriate for your home. And then it's also great to talk to your, uh, to your insurance provider about that because it's, it's, quite, it's becoming increasingly common now that for uh, installing a backwater valve, you can receive uh, a discount on your insurance. So um, it's just work with the pros, do it one step at a time. Don't assume that everybody, every house is right for a backwater valve and make sure it's done right so that you're protecting yourself. Okay, great. Um, oh, Owen, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn on your camera so that we can see you. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, later this week, you will receive an email that provides contact information for the presenters, links to the Home Flood Protection Toolkit, the presentation slides, a recording of the webinar, and a link to an exit survey. Uh, your feedback about the webinar is very much appreciated, so if you could um, give us that, that would be great. And uh, at this time, I would like for uh, Dr. Walmsley to come back and give us some closing remarks. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really great session here today, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, not only do we have people in the Antigonish region, with us, we have people from across the province and from across the country. Um, so I'm really appreciative. Uh, we've got a great impetus here for some action plans um, using this information. And I think it's really, this is uh, research that gets right down to the population uh, who need it. And uh, very pleased about being a part of this project and looking forward to uh, how people follow up with this on a regional basis and hearing some of the results, uh, hopefully by the end of December on uh, what people have found. Uh, special thanks um, to, for the generosity of the INTAC group, uh, Blair and Daniel and, and Cheryl. Thank you for making yourself available <clears throat> and for your generosity in being available offline to all our participants. That, that really means something to all of us. So thank you very much for wonderful presentations today and for taking our questions. And of course, for the work that you do and will continue to do as we uh, bring this to our people in our regions, um, not only here in Nova Scotia, but across the country. And uh, to our partners, really appreciative of your, your time and participation, uh, Mayor Boucher, and of course, uh, Warden McCarran. And in absentia, I'd like to thank Chief PJ Prosper and our elder and residents, Carrie Prosper, for their participation as well as partners. A special thanks to Eileen Alma for uh, working out Zoom for us today and all her work. And special thanks to Lynn Delory for all of the work in um, arranging and organizing and contacting people. She did a lot of work uh, to make this happen. And lastly, uh, to Dr. Kareen Cash for uh, being our host today and for really getting this whole thing off the ground um, uh, with the workshop and the seminar series. Thank you very much. So with that, thanks to everyone. Uh, have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.